the tempest. Prospero saw Ferdinand from afar, following bewitched behind Ariel's glimmering light. When the young prince was close by, Prospero touched Miranda on the shoulder, releasing her from the spell. And instantly she woke, and the first thing she saw was Ferdinand. Is this a spirit, father? He gasped. No, my child. It is a man of flesh and blood like you and me, Prospero told her. But I thought all men had white hair and beards like yours, Miranda exclaimed. <laughs> Prospero smiled and signaled to Ariel. The dancing lights <laughs> vanished and Ferdinand's trance was broken. He saw Miranda and his eyes filled with wonder and her beauty. Am I still dreaming? His, he whispered. Is this a vision? I am no vision, sir, Miranda said. I am as real as you are, if you are indeed real. Shyly, she reached out her hand. Ferdinand reached out his and their fingertips touched. I saw in the stars that you were meant for each other, Prospero said softly. Your love will undo all the evil done by hatred. Miranda and Ferdinand heard nothing of this, for they were totally lost in each other. Ariel, said Prospero, Find King Alonso and my brother Antonio, and when you do, Ariel listened carefully, and before long, the air was bright with his laughter. On another part of the beach, two sailors swayed across the sand, leaning against each other to stop themselves from falling over. One was Trinculo. A thin man with ginger hair and a freckled face, and his companion was Stefano, who had a shock of grey hair and a stomach as round as a watermelon. <laughs> they had been washed ashore together with a cask of wine, which they had fast consumed. Now they were so drunk that when Caliban jumped out from behind a rock and groveled at their feet, they were not entirely sure that he was really there. Caliban had been watching Trinculo and Stefano for some time, and his quick, cunning mind had seen a way to use them to get rid of his master Prospero. Gentle gods, Caliban cried, have you come from the sky to save me? Well, he thinks we are gods, Trinculo giggled. Mm, he's an ugly brute, but he knows good breeding when he sees it, whispered Stefano. That's right, we are gods from the moon, he said to Caliban. Save me, Caliban begged. Save me from the wicked enchanter who has enslaved me, and I will give you all this treasure and be your faithful servant forever. <laughs> enchanter? yelled Trinculo, turning pale. Courage, Trinculo! Stefano murmured. And what kind of treasure might that be, good monster? Gold, said Caliban, and silver and many jewels. Stefano drew his cutlers and weighed it so clumsily that he almost cut off his right ear. <laughs> Pirates and chanters is all the same to me, he boasted. Take me to the villain, I'll carve him into thin slices. With a whoop of delight, Caliban led the way along the jungle track to Prospero's cave. And after the long walk through the jungle's heat and shadows and strange cells, Stefano's head began to clear, and he no longer felt as bold as he had earlier, and Trinculo was trembling like a mouse's whiskers. Um, is it much further? Stefano asked Caliban. Oh, there! Caliban replied, pointing. 
Trinkolo stood on tiptoes and peered. He could see the mouth of a cave filled with an ominous darkness. Why don't, don't we walk side by side? He gibbered. Then nothing can harm us. Even as he spoke, the darkness in the cave began to move. It poured out of the cave mouth, coiling like black mist, and the mist transformed itself into a pack of savage black dogs with red eyes and slavering fangs. Snapping and snarling, the dogs bounded towards the intruders. Trinculo and Stefano turned and ran screaming into the jungle with Caliban close behind. King Alonso and Antonio had also been wandering through the jungle for hours, and now they were desperate with thirst and hunger. Their fine clothes, ripped by cruel thorns, hung around them in tatters, and sweat streamed down their faces. Alonso, certain that Ferdinand was dead, was stricken with grief. And at last, he slumped onto the trunk of a fallen tree. I can go no further, he groaned. I will wait here for death to put an end to my misery. Antonio glanced around uneasily. The jungle was an eerie place full of shadows and whispering voices. Just a little further, my lord, he said. I see a clearing not far ahead. Perhaps we will find a spring of fresh water there. The thought of water urged Alonso to his feet, and together the two men stumbled towards the edge of the clearing. Like a mirage, in the middle of the clearing stood a long table, piled with food and drink golden platters of carved meat, whole roasted fowl, and baskets of bread and golden jugs of wine. <sighs> Alonso and Antonio hurried towards it, but before they could reach the feast, there was a dazzling flash of light, and Ariel appeared. He hovered over the table in the shape of a harpy. A monster with a human head and the body of a gigantic eagle. Alonso tried to snatch a jug of wine, but the harpy hissed and slashed at him with his bronze talons. Foul spirit, why do you torment us? Antonio sobbed. For thy betrayal of thy brother Prospero and sneeze Miranda, the harpy screeched. Thou and King Alonso did set them in a boat and leave them to the mercy of the ocean. Prepare thee for thy punishment. Alonso and Antonio stared in amazement wondering how the spirit had discovered their guilty secret and they expected the harpy to tear them into pieces but instead it faded into a cloud of tiny lights that swelled like specks of dust floating in a beam of sunlight the two men fell themselves fall into a waking sleep and heard a voice speaking to them out of the cloud um, it said, follow, follow. From all over the island, the crew of the wrecked ship came to gather on the beach near Prospero's cave. Drawn there by magic, even Trinculo and Stefano, who had aching hats and torn clothes from where their hounds had snapped at them. The sailors rejoiced to see friends they thought had perished and gazed about in wonder. Had the storm only been a dream or were they dreaming now? For there was the ship undamaged, anchored close to the shore. 
the sailors laughed and scratched their heads, unable to believe their luck. Ariel brought Alonso and Antonio to the mouth of Prospero's cave and broke their trance. Alonso gasped as Ferdinand and Miranda stepped out of the darkness hand in hand and his eyes blurred with tears. <gasps> oh, what wonderful new world is this that has such people in it? He wondered. The world that will be made when we return to Naples and our children are joined in marriage, said the boys. Alonso and Antonio turned and saw Prospero standing behind them. Antonio could not meet his brother's eyes and hung his head in shame. Let our old hate be ended by their young love, Alonso, Prospero said, and he came forward and placed his hand on Antonio's shoulder. I forgive you, brother, he said. We will rule Milan together and end our days in peace. Now go down to the shore and make ready to leave this island forever. Are you coming, father? asked Miranda. In a moment, my child, Prospero said. He waited until he was alone, then whispered, Ariel. Ariel grew out of emptiness. Too excited to hold one shape, he turned into a hummingbird. Then a butterfly, then a winged unicorn. I have burned my books of magic and my wizard's staff, Prospero declared. You are free to go, my Ariel, but I shall sadly miss you. And I shall miss thee, dear master, said Ariel. But look for me in springtime blossom, or when the summer breeze stirs thy curtain, or when the winter stars blaze bright. Until then, farewell. Farewell, sweet spirit, said Prospero. And he turned away so that Ariel would not see the tears in his eyes. As the ship's sails unfurled and it began to glide away, Caliban came out of his hiding place in the jungle. He danced on the beach, turning cartwheels as he whooped. I am king of the island, king! His voice frightened a flock of parrots who clattered out of the treetops and flew over Caliban in a great circle, their plumage glittering like the jewels in a royal crown.